Um, really good to be here. I'm originally from County Sligo, so it feels sort of like I'm back at home. I'm uh, the last uh, eight years in Brussels working for FACE, which is the European Federation for Hunting and Conservation. And we're generally dealing with uh, the issues affecting, generally dealing with all of the issues affecting hunting or shooting and conservation at the European and international level. Our members are the national hunting associations in 37 countries. UK, Ireland and Italy are a little bit different. We have a face Ireland, face UK and face Italy because you have more than one uh, hunting activity. Uh, the big association in Ireland would be NARGC and UK, Basque. Uh, and we are, uh, you, know, you might ask the question, why do we need a voice for Europe's hunters or game shooting community in Brussels? Well, there's a wide range of uh, rules and regulations affecting the average hunter directly and indirectly. Uh, and what I'm particularly interested in talking about today is our nature policy at the EU level, which is uh, some really interesting things happening. Uh, and I'm gonna really have a habitat-based focus on my presentation today. And I'm gonna try and give some examples from around Europe. Um, we work in the context of taking evidence-based decisions we have 16 staff. I think if we were taking evidence-based decisions, we'd probably only need two staff. But we have a mixture of um, science, uh, conservation, uh, legal, and public affairs. Uh, we've been actively involved in a wide range of discussions, particularly around migratory birds, which is one of our big work pillars in FACE. Um, and whether it's looking at the sustainability of hunting and conservation priorities, and indeed, I've met some of the participants of this conference before. We've been involved in action planning projects around uh, lowland grassland breeding waders around Europe. Um, actually, the title of my presentation is really about the role of the shooting community uh, in terms of conservation of breeding waders. And I'm really not going to focus on that too much, but just to say there's a lot of work taking place in all European countries by the game shooting uh, community. And it's the same type of examples that have been given today. They're directly involved or supporting conservation initiatives. They could be directly for red grouse and a byproduct is curlew, or increasingly it could be for curlew uh, in itself. We map all of these projects. We have uh, the Biodiversity Manifesto. We have five or 600 of these. And uh, when things are good, we give out awards every couple of years. So there's a huge amount of work being undertaken uh, by the hunting community around Europe. When we look at what's, what types of habitats is this work taking place, mostly on farmland and wetlands. And this is really good. This is the creation and management of ecological features, habitat work, restoration, but also other core work that's needed, for example, control of um, predators. We have a major problem, and this is a European-wide problem, but Ireland deserves a special award because it's lost more wetlands than any other country uh, over quite a long period of time. So we really have a habitat loss problem uh, driving the problem we have with breeding waders. Uh, Europe-wide, but Ireland um, is unfortunately a winner there. Uh, we also need to rethink our approach to the management of abundant generalist predators. Really nice publication here by Barry McMahon and others. Uh, and I'm always conscious around which terminology to use. Uh, Porek mentioned the local gun club structure in Ireland. There it's called uh, vermin control. Uh, but when you get to the policy level, it's increasingly called nest protection. Uh, but in general, we're talking about the same thing and the need to increase, uh, rethink our approach and scale up, which is what I'm going to come to shortly. We have a major problem on farmlands. This was mentioned, and our farmland birds are doing very badly. We know what the main driver is. Unfortunately, the debate at the EU level is increasingly polarized, and it's unfortunate that it's very much um, more centered around farmers that are doing a very good job in uh, producing food, high-quality food that's affordable. Um, but the range of other goods and services that the policy is moving towards, that's really going to center in, in the debate about the next European farming policy. And there's some really interesting things happening, like the UK's approach to move away from direct payments. Uh, when we look at our birds, regardless if they're huntable or not huntable, it's the same story. We have almost half of them in an unfavorable condition. 
And when we look at our migratory birds, including some of our waders, anything that's dependent on nature in Europe in terms of a breeding population status is in bad shape. And we're lucky in some respects that our, the birds we receive in the winter still have a secure status. Um, and this is just a trend we see. Wintering status for a lot of species is quite different from our breeding status. Uh, and this is the core um, challenge in terms of scale and what do we need for our breeding waders or our ground nesting birds. We are working in the context of a more performance-based common agricultural policy, uh, environmental care, um, landscapes, and we have all of the National CAP strategic plans published, and we have some interesting things on the table, and I'll come back to this shortly. This is the big problem that was mentioned by, uh, in, in the very first presentation. Uh, again, we're really good at producing good quality food, but we've lost a lot of our wildlife accordingly, and in particular on grasslands and the intensification of farming here. When we look at uh, the conservation measures that work, and in particular breeding waders on grasslands, there is a frequent focus on agri-environmental schemes. This is a really nice paper. And when we target these, we can get results. Uh, 10 times more uh, effectiveness than non-targeted schemes. And in general, we know what can work if you modify mowing re regimes, uh, increasing wet conditions, and the use of nest protection. It's a really nice study there. So let's get to work. But Let's get the work at the correct scale. And this is the big issue because there's some really nice examples of, of small and fairly large scale conservation efforts, community based, great partnerships. And I'll refer to one of these a little bit later. Um, but unless we have these at the right scale, we are in big trouble for our breeding waders. We've been working a lot at the Brussels level in, in, the, in let's say, the last CAP reform to really push for a better cap for biodiversity. Our entry point is really birds, small wild game populations. And this includes breeding waders, so space for nature. Um, also, um, so a lot of this is focused on the definitions and the EU uh, cap regulations. So we're, we're talking about very specific things like the definition for permanent grassland, uh, defining agricultural activity, and talking about land eligibility. And we have more opportunities now to have space for nature on farmlands than ever before. Unfortunately, not many member states have availed of the flexibility that's there. And this is a, going to be a big debate moving forward on the common agricultural policy. This is really interesting, some of these results-based agri-environmental schemes. We have good examples of these schemes throughout Europe. Uh, we have a really nice um, uh, approach in Ireland, looking at uh, eight areas in, in these uh, EIPs in the current agri-environmental climate measure. And here, I think Ireland is, is doing the right thing. It's identifying areas that are important and trying to fit these into um, agri-environmental measures. And some of the work in Ireland has really involved a wide range of organisations working together and in all of this, I think champions have really driven these projects. Um, as some of you will know the successful project around the burn. Here, the farmer is paid for the production of species-rich grassland. They're not really interested in what the farmer does, but they are interested in measuring the quality of this at the end of the year. And the farmer knows best how to produce species-rich grassland. And this is a scheme that has high farmer satisfaction. It's working well. The hen harrier scheme is interesting also from a European-wide perspective because of this hybrid approach and you're looking at bird population uh, targeting in this scheme. Uh, so conservation actions plus trying to pay for the, the delivery of a specific target and that's really interesting. And we have some of other schemes around Europe that are also really nice as well and the main message is you can have your intensive farming, really productive driven agricultural models but you can have biodiversity at the same time. And there's some really nice examples here. And if we can get to a place, here there's one scheme in the Netherlands, payments for the number of clutches on the farmland. And this is related to uh, meadow birds. And if we can scale this up, I think we're moving into the right space. The whole discussion about results-based agri-environmental schemes hasn't been uh, as smooth as we would like. We are really pushing this from a face perspective. Uh, the big farm uh, interest group in Brussels, Copacogeca, would constantly say, yes, but there's uncertainty. 
uh, and, 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 and yes, if the design isn't good, you may have uh, climatic events that may affect the results, but the good thing is, in general, uh, farmers seem very satisfied with schemes like this. And I think the main message is, if they're well designed, like a well designed car, they will deliver good results for uh, the particular target. These are taking place in the Netherlands here, are good examples inside uh, protected areas and outside protected areas. Here's an example of a project uh, in the middle of, of Ireland um, between Atlone and Ballinasloe. Porek Breen mentioned this, uh, one of the most well-known projects. And this is the importance of the local community-based uh, initiative. And this is, uh, here's a, a better snapshot of Ballydangan Bog. And here's when you look at curlew numbers on the site. And I think uh, it was also mentioned the need for independent monitoring. I think the local guys there always knew that curlew were doing well, and it was largely a byproduct of their work for red grouse when they were putting in place habitat and predator measures. And uh, it's now, you could argue, it's one of the really good hotspots uh, in the Republic of Ireland for breeding curlew. Not captured in any formal scheme, it's just a local community driven by the local gun club doing the right thing with a relatively small amount of money. Small amount of money, you're talking four or five thousand euros a year. They're lucky to have a, a Department of um, Social Protection, a CE scheme as well. And this is the type of work they're doing. Habitat management, predator management, disturbance control, and they're all very happy folks and they're doing, you cannot have a project like this without informing the public and some of this is really getting into local schools and building support at the wider level for conservation where an area where raised bogs were deemed to be rather worthless to raised bogs being deemed to be the future of all of our biodiversity and climate problems and the local community is really proud of this. One of the big opportunities we have um, is the Nature Restoration Regulation, which was a really contested piece of legislation in terms of the debate in Brussels and at national level. The majority of member states supported this. Um, it just survived the vote in the European Parliament. Um, and it's now, let's say, concluded what we call the trialogue process. So all the three in main institutions have agreed on this. It needs a few final votes. But this means that each member state has to put in place a national nature restoration plan in a couple of years' time. And here's a really good opportunity uh, to work for breeding waders as well. We've welcomed this. We've been reliant on protection as a tool for the last 30 years at the EU level, mainly protected areas and mainly strict species protection. And that hasn't delivered. So this is a really nice way to work in the wider countryside in the context of restoration, not restricting any activities, but really uh, restoring nature. And there's a lot of really juicy things here. The whole debate was focused, do we just concentrate this in Nature 2000 areas or not? Um, the the uh, actually European Parliament called for a total deletion of agricultural ecosystems here. This goes back to the importance of a good design and the importance of having stakeholders engaged at a very early stage. Um, what we're trying to do in Brussels is wrapped up in what's called the Green Deal and the Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, but it's really a tricky debate. Uh, yesterday, um, a proposal to reduce pesticides didn't even pass the European Parliament, so it's all very political. And the core thing is the farmers are absolutely going to be the future, and especially those that represent the farmers at the different level. They're really important. If we have them on board, we can start talking about scale. But in each national... Uh, restoration plan. There's some nice opportunities to deal with the habitats of all birds and also the habitats listed in Annex 1 uh, of the Habitats Directive, which includes a lot of our grasslands. And our grasslands are in really, really bad shape, especially those in Annex 1 of the Habitats Directive. So this is a really nice opportunity here. And the key to this is going to be a well-designed national uh, restoration plan. This is as a result of Brexit, Northern Ireland and the UK being out of this map. Um, of course, I would guess the UK will also move on having a, a national nature restoration plan because all of this is informed by uh, wider international policy. <clears throat> so, what's my main message? Um, I just pulled this because I think scale is, is really important. I couldn't find the right thing, but I think what are our recommendations as a group to really up the scale. 
uh, it doesn't have to be 10. I think if this group today could even promote maybe three recommendations to scale up. And the core challenge is these birds are doing really badly from a, from a breeding perspective. Uh, we are, I think we're in the right place to say well done to all of those initiatives that are really delivering. But unless we're going to be monitoring uh, populations to, to an extinction, we really need to scale up. And how we do that, in our view, is farming policy. Farming policy at the national level because there's huge flexibility for member states to design really good national cap strategic plans. The same in the UK, We're very impressed by what the UK is attempting to do to move away from direct payments to really reward um, uh, more of the environmental components of, of farming. And it's clear, I think the next debate at the EU level uh, is going to be, I think it's going to be a very difficult one, but it's very clear from a farming policy perspective, we're definitely need to reward and incentivize the production of what we're talking about today, breeding waders, environment, uh, these environmental goods and services, as well as food. And my second message, the nature restoration law provides, I think, a really good opportunity because there's some minimum criteria, but there's nothing to stop member states going, going far. And I mean far is really making sure that the key groups are going to support these plans. So I think the farming community, the landowning community, they are absolutely essential. On the positive note, many of the nice results-based agro-environmental schemes have high farmer satisfaction. So that's what we think needs to happen going forward. Thank you very much.